Welcome to the Why on Earth Community Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron William Perry, and today we're visiting with Nathan Stuck, the founder of Profitable Purpose Consulting. Hey, Nathan, how you doing? I am doing great. How are you doing? Doing great, man. And uh, yeah, so, so happy to have this opportunity to visit with you and share a bit with our audience about all of this really exciting work you're doing with companies all around the country and, and globally. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I keep myself busy. We'll just say that. <laughs> Love we'll it. Unpack, we'll unpack all of it. I'm sure. Yeah. I look forward to it. Nathan is an award-winning leader in the B Corp community and the founder of profitable purpose consulting, a culture impact and B Corp consultancy. He founded and chairs B Local Georgia and serves on the board of B Academics, a nonprofit committed to research and experiential B Corp learning opportunities. Nathan teaches an MBA course on B Corps at the University of Georgia, is a regular speaker at conferences and on podcasts around the world, and hosts the Be the Change Georgia podcast. His first book, Happy Monday, Designing Your Career with Purpose, was released in 2022. And, and Nathan, yeah, we'll be, I'll show it for the audience <laughs> looking at the video here. I'll, we'll, we'll talk about the book a little bit too. But, uh, you know, before getting to that, just to kind of set the stage here, what the heck uh, does B Corp mean? What are, what are we even talking about here? You're doing so much with so many different organizations related to this B Corp thing. Well, first of all, you have to be careful because if you say B Corp three times fast, I just show up in your living room and start talking to you about B Corp. So um, <laughs> it's like Beetlejuice. Um, <laughs> we're dating ourselves. Now we're starting to reference 80s. Yeah, movies. I know um, what that means. <laughs> um, but anyway, B, so B Corp's, it's a cert, outside certification that businesses can get. And I always tell people it's, B Corp is to a business what lead is to a building. So and that's I don't need leadership. you to understand everything that goes into it. I just need you to yeah. know it's the gold standard of corporate social responsibility. And it looks at, you know, the, the overall business and its practices. So it's looking at your, um, your corporate governance, your, your, your workers, your community impact, your environmental impact, and then kind of how you treat your customers, what you're doing with data, those types of things. So it's kind of a holistic view of, the business. So it's not just looking at like your facilities or your products. It's looking at everything and making sure that you get a minimum score, verified score too. anybody that's been through it knows it's a not so fun verification process that I'm, I'm literally will be spending my Friday night working on one tonight. Um, just uploading documentation. You have to prove it. You can't just tell people, Oh, we're doing, we're doing these great things and, and you're going to get the certification. It's like, Oh, that's really cool. You guys did a lot of volunteering, prove it. So it's, yeah, it's vetted. It's outside certification. It's an outside certification. And I mean, and in, in a day and age where everybody's saying how great they are, it's kind of hard to believe anybody anymore. So that's kind of where that certification comes in. It's kind of the uh, like lead. I don't really know everything that goes into lead. I walk in and go, huh, must be efficient. But I know it's, I know it's like, that's it for buildings like lead awesome. platinum. Wow. But I don't, you know, the same thing with B Corp. I don't need you to know everything. I just need you to have that same kind of wow reaction when you meet a B Corp. Love it. Yeah. And um, I imagine most of our audience knows what lead stands for. It's leadership in what is it? Energy and environment or environment and energy design for buildings, right? It has to do with the. Sounds, the, uh, it sounds good. Environmental impacts, footprints, um, yep. energy efficiency. Yeah. And like are, how well are you using like natural lighting? This is where I wish yeah. my, uh, my colleague Jenna was here. Cause Jenna, before I got her to come work for me, she was doing lead certifications and, uh, fit well and all these different things. So I kind of brought on somebody who, uh, strengthens my weaknesses. Not that it's a weakness. It's just something that I've never really worked with. And she was, that's what she was doing. So, but she's also a B Corp expert. So now I have my, my full team. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it, Nathan. And 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 having uh, taken a company through the certification process about a decade ago, um, I can attest that it is very thorough, rigorous, and and therefore really meaningful when a when a company is able to display that that B certification logo on their products or website or whatever. Um, and and I'm wondering at this point, do you have any idea how many 
companies worldwide have this certification approximately like ballpark? Uh, it's over 7,000. So I would say by the time he releases, I'd say we'll be close to around 8,000 around the world. It's uh, amazing. Yeah, it's nuts. I mean, and they're finally solved the, 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 the queue, which they were, I mean, just 2020 that, I mean, you'd think that there would have been a, a drop in demand in 2020 and in reality, the exact opposite happened and they got slammed with companies like doubling down on their values. And so it took them a while to, to dig out from under the, the increase in, in applications. So now it's, it's almost moving so fast as a consultant, you're like, you hit submit and you're, we were used to waiting like multiple months until we heard anything. And now you're like, Oh God, you already want to start uploading things. Like <laughs> they take a breather here. So it's, it's been pretty crazy how, um, how quickly they've, they've worked through the queue and now how quickly companies are like, um, and my phone never stops ringing. So it's, it's clearly, I think we've passed that critical, critical mass, whatever you want to call it, critical threshold of whatever you want to call it, like the case for the ROI or whatever that I think companies are now just getting it. And good companies are realizing that to distinguish themselves as a good company, they, they need it. Love this. And and your phone's ringing off the hook and might be even, even further as especially your offering a special uh, promotional 15% discount off your services for the why on earth community network. And, and we'll have uh, the, information the links etc on our um, partners and supporters page at whyonearth.org for folks who are interested in connecting with you that way of course we'll provide other links and uh, social media handles and so on but uh, it's so it's so great to hear nathan and can you just tell us so with your consulting company what what is the nature of services you're providing you're you're helping people get the certification right yeah, I mean, working through, I mean, I've, we've done some stuff where people have just wanted to kind of use it as the guiding tool for, especially when you, my background professionally, the B Corp I worked at before I started my own company, I was culture and impact. I was director of, you know, corporate culture, strategic impact. So I love those projects where we're using the B Impact Assessment, even if they don't necessarily want to certify, using it as a guide. Um, and I would tell every business owner to use it as a guide, um, it just, to, just to baseline check where you're at. But the majority, I'd say 90% of what we do is B Corp certification projects. So, um, and, and, you know, working with clients to kind of figure out like um, what it is they need, you know, what is the, you know, cause for some clients, you know, early stage startups, it might not make sense yet from a, Hey, we're fundraising, go fundraise, you know? And so like finding that trusted partner that you can, that you have that can kind of shoot you straight and let you know, kind of like, Hey, here's what makes sense. Um, or here's what I would do right now. Um, I think that's important too. Cause I, I, I know now there's, and there's not really many or any bad players out in the, you know, in the B Corp space, there's not a lot of people that are like, well, here's a quick buck. I'm going to be a B Corp consultant. But I think there's also a lot of people seeing this demand and moving into the space that maybe don't have the experience to give you the best advice for the business. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I mean, anybody listening that just wants to kind of like to have a conversation about it and where, you know, where's that ROI for our business? What would, what, you know, what is it, what would it take for us to do, um, what are the legal requirements? What are the, you know, just kind of to, to, to take that kind of moment to look at like, is it right right now? Um, and if so, how do we proceed and how do we do it in a way? Cause the other part too, is like, how do you do it in a way that's digestible? It's a lot of, well, you've been through it. It's, huge. it's a lot of work. Yeah. It's a lot of work too. So like, how do we chunk this out? So your CEO and your, or your, you know, your sales team or your, you know, all these people where it's like, man, I'm paying you to do this. Uh, we can pay Nathan to do that. Um, and yeah. keep you focused and all you have to do is show up for an hour a week and kind of run through this with us. So we try to make it as hands off as possible as well. Like yeah, it's really hire consultants. A valuable service. I actually kind of wish I would have had access to you 10 years ago when we were going through it ourselves. Well, now it's crazy because you probably wouldn't even recognize it now because it's moved. I mean, it's like lead, like lead, what, what yeah. lead standards were in the seventies are now like building codes. That's just right. like city building code. Like it's so like they've moved this needle and you're seeing in the B Corp space where they're about to come out with version seven next year. They're on version six right now. 
And um, yeah, I don't even know if you'd recognize it. And it's gotten so, I don't want to say complicated, but so there's, there's things where the B Corp community might be hip to it, but it's new to a, uh, a lot of people, like some of the, some of the concepts. And so you'd see, I'll get a lot of people who like submit, they get through it on their own, or maybe they don't even submit, but they get through it on their own. And they're like, I don't, I don't know what to do with the rest of this. So um, they end up finding us or sometimes they get all the way to the end. And now it's like time to do the, like the up the documentation and the proof. And they're like, can you help us finish this? Cause then it gets super time intensive and you've got some CEO or co-founder or whatever, trying to do all this. And there's like, I, I just, just tell me your rate, send me a quote and let's, let's get to work. And I'm like, cool. so we get a lot of those too, where it's like, just finish this for me. That's great. Oh man. You're providing such an important service. Is it, would you say you're finding that, the some of the the assessment process that is perhaps a little less familiar to executives and founders is more on the like culture side or more on the like carbon footprint you know accounting supply chain value chain accounting side life cycle um i think a lot of companies i guess it depends on the sector they're in of what they struggle with more mm -hmm. um i know from a you know, like, cause you'll see, like, I mean, I've heard professional services companies tell me that like, Oh, this thing's rigged. Cause you can never be a beacon unless you're like a manufacturer with a huge supply chain. And then you talk to a manufacturer and they're like, it's so hard to be a B Corp. Cause like, you know, we have like factory workers and like, so we, you know, like our benefits aren't, you know, and you're like, all right, y'all just, you're going to get more points in the, in the environmental section because of your supply chain and what you can control. You're going to get more in the worker section. So I think you see based on the industry, like what they're more used to talking about and dealing with. So like, you know, when I work with professional services companies, they crush the worker section and they've got the benefits on and you take them and you're like, Hey, so what's your carbon footprint look like? No. Uh, how energy efficient you're building? I, I don't know. Um, we put in some low flow, low flow sinks, low flow toilets. You know, okay. So you have no idea. Got it. And same thing. A lot of times with, um, you know, your manufacturing, your whatever CPG products, sometimes it's like when you get into like the, like not even worker benefits, but like the corporate culture component, they're like, um, well, we do a happy hour once a quarter, <laughs> you know, and it's like, yeah. no, 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 no. Like what is, okay. So it's, it's kind of fun to go back and forth and, and, and see those, I don't know, I don't want to say struggles, but the aha moments as they come out of like, oh, okay, I get it now. Oh, but yeah. So. It's such a great education. And, and for folks who maybe don't know, CPG is a uh, consumer packaged goods and think like drinks and things we buy at a store, generally speaking, uh, um yeah sorry that, that's a, that's a one of those is my mba so i speak in a lot of yeah school jargon yeah so well, that's, what you, that's what the degree is basically you just learn jargon did you just throw jargon around sounds love it. yeah <laughs> i guess like we should mention roi is return on investment also um and, and i'm curious because i'm used to seeing a lot of b certified you know a lot of different companies out there especially in the cpg space I, I make decisions on beverages and snacks based on seeing that and or the 1% for the planet certification. And, and we know a lot of companies have both the B1s. They're lovingly uh, called. Proud B1. Yeah. And uh, so I, I'm wondering, you know, we're seeing more and more um, entrepreneurs and executives making deep social and environmental commitments through their businesses you know, with or without the third party certifications. And so when you've got companies like that out there, and we're obviously seeing many, many more of them, which is wonderful, you know, why get certified? What's the reason, the rationale, what's in your experience, the business case for that? I thought you'd never ask. Um, I just, um, <laughs> You know, and it's funny, too, because I, I get that a lot, too. Like, well, we're already doing this. So, like, why would we pay for a certification? You're like, well, okay, well. And then out of the other side of the mouth, you hear the argument of, like, man, nobody really notices, like, all the good we do. And I'm just like. <laughs> and so, for me, like, I'll start here and I'll get into the, the ROI and some of that. It's like, if you go on any company's website, like, we could pick a company right now. And I guarantee you there's, like, an About Us page that has, like, their mission and their values and like, and if they make something, there's going to be a sustainability page. Sheehan, 
Um, Sheehan has a sustainability page. Sorry, I can't say that laughing. Um, yeah, Sheehan, who like releases like 400 new product lines, like or things per day or something, whatever the horrible number is. Um, wow. The king of fast or the queen of fast fashion has has a sustainability page. So anyway, everybody's doing it. So as a consumer, it has become near impossible. I, I like it's so noisy, and and unless you're in this. Like you and I can sniff out the BS really quickly. Um, most people can't. So it all just sounds like white noise. It's all just jargon. And like, I mean, and like you look at the back of a bar of chocolate, like there's some, so many of these certifications, you get all natural. I would hope so. It's a bar of chocolate. What, how would it not be natural? Like, <laughs> I heard a chocolatier tell me that one time. He's like, what is it from outer space? Like, <laughs> like I, that doesn't mean anything. So it, People don't, none, none of it means that your, your, your marketing can't, none of it means anything to a consumer anymore. None of it means anything to a potential employee because we just assume everybody's full of it. I mean, that's the way I look when I just roll my eyes at these commercials and like, oh, this is XYZ companies committed to serving their community. And we do blah, blah, community service every quarter with our team and, Sure you do. Great. I, I'm, I'm guessing you do. That's awesome. Oh, look at them. They're all in their, their, their company shirts. And look at, oh, look, oh, look at the commercials. They're planting a tree. And oh my, look at the diversity on that team. Oh my God, this is a great company. Like, it's just all like, you, you look like everybody else. So to me, that's the B Corp value is it's like, oh, you've been vetted. Okay. I don't really need to tell you much. Like, I mean, I kind of tell my companies like, my clients, I'm like, use it as a bundle. One of these days, I'm going to do something with my bees for a bundle blog. Hopefully, it's released by the time this comes out. I've written it. it. But use it to like bring people back. Like when you're talking about your impact, when you're talking about your community, when you're talking about your you know, your work in, in bringing in diverse teams and diverse customers and creating safe spaces and, and being inclusive, like bring it back to the bee. Because that will remind people that like you're not just putting your PR and marketing team on this campaign to make it sound fluffy like this we do this because we're a b corp we do this because it's in our dna and customers will again going back to what i said to open this i don't need you to know what i don't need you to all i need what i want somebody to take away from this episode as a consumer is recognizing that b and if you have option one and option two and one of them has a b corp logo and you're not sure which one to buy buy the b corp logo if it's Dr. Bronner's or XYZ brand, buy Dr. Bronner's. If it's Allbirds or Nike, buy the Allbirds. Um, because at least it's been vetted. I don't know. Nike might be doing some great things. I don't know. I wore Nike my whole life. I probably still own some Nikes, but like now it's Allbirds. It's Tom's yeah. shoes. It's Patagonia. It's Olukai's. I bought some Olukai's. Those are awesome, by the way. Uh, Hawaiian shoe, B Corp. Um, but yeah, I spend, you know, vote with your dollar. So, that, I mean, that to me is the ROI in this thing is, is the differentiating aspect of like, we get employees at my old job, we hired fresh out of college and they, just about all of them would say like, number one reason on the survey, why'd you come over here and be like B Corp. And then you get to orientation and be like, so who knows what a B Corp is? None of them, but they wanted to work for a B Corp. So it's like the brand is, is, is valuable. Um, and, and honestly, I will say as well, your business will be better for having gone through the process. Somebody yeah. I, I've been called multiple times. They're like, you're more of like an operations consultant. And I'm like, Oh, thank you. Um, Cause your brand's going to be better. You're going to tell better stories at the end of this. Cause now you're going to have quantifiable metrics. You're going to have KPIs, key performance indicators that you run your company off of that aren't just sales and revenue and da 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 and pipeline funnel and blah. You know, like you're still going to watch that stuff. You're running a for-profit business, but you're also going to be like, what are we on track for this year with volunteer hours? What percentage of revenue are we going to give away in pro bono product or service or whatever, or charitable donations? Like how are we trending towards these things that we have committed our business to that we stand for? Um, what percentage of our employees have volunteered? Like all these different things. Like, but when you have that data now, I can tell better stories. I can, I, you know, I can, I can pitch it better to, to future employees. Um, it's just, I don't know, it gives it more teeth. And yeah, you go through some of these things and the processes and like, it literally, when you boil it down to common denominators, it's everything we teach in a business school. It's good business love it. and good business is good business. So like I'm trying to beat that drum. I'm going to make that my, my new catchphrase. Good business is good business. Good business is good business. I like that. And, and I like vetted and vouched for, you know, it's uh, 
I, what I'm, what I'm sensing is, and, and I explore some of this in, in the book I wrote, Why on Earth Community, there's a chapter on demand about the power of consumer demand, right? And so I'm, I'm sensing part of the business case and rationale for the executives and business owners to go through the process is, is sure, you, you're going to get an advantage, a competitive advantage in the marketplace with that recognition. Secondly, what you just spoke to, the business itself may find some improvements and efficiencies that contribute to the overall performance. And then third, which to me is one of the most intriguing that you also spoke to with those young interns and new hires coming in is the ability to attract and, and retain, you know, better talent relative to the competition out there. And, and I think of all the tipping points we're seeing, that last one is is really one of the very interesting as we go forward over the next five, 10 years. And this, you know, competitive landscape worldwide is really shifting around these these shared values of environmental stewardship and social responsibility. And it's just, it's so exciting to think about all of this through the lens of business and economics. Oh, and thank you um, for bringing that up because I was talking to a friend the other day and like, where, you know, all this stuff and, you know, and, and we're recording this a couple of weeks after Supreme court decisions and, um, people kind of ask me like, well, what, you know, what do you think about this or private industry that? And I'm like, and like, Oh, and we were just barely removed from the Bud Light controversy. My response is bring it like, let's to quote my old quarterback from my Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Let's F and go. Like I want the battle. I want like, I'm, I, these are both business school degrees. Like I said it in my Ted talk, like I'm an unapologetic capitalist. I think it's the best system we've discovered. I got family in East Germany. Yeah, I want a good system. Like, there's not, there's like, there's nothing that that drives innovation, like being rewarded for risks that you're taking and 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 putting yourself out there and risking failure. And like, now capitalism off the rails is off the rails. So like, we can talk about that. I'm not defending greedy capitalism. I got plenty of Thomas Piketty on my bookshelf, but capitalism is also like competition. It's free market. It's fair free market like you're going to bring customers in and you don't tell the customers which ones they have to shop at so if you want to run your business and never serve an lgbtq customer and never employ one and they're like i just want to see over the next 20 years like let's go let's have that battle i'm gonna run my company as b corp yeah. and i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna champion all the things we champion you continue to hate on DEI and hate on LGBTQ and don't want, don't believe in climate change. And don't yeah. like, I just, I just think you're, it's, you're kind of like betting on the dinosaurs. Um, and I think I just, I, I firmly believe that this next generation cares enough. And if we, you know, market it the right way and talk about it the right way and, and help people understand that it's just good business. I don't think there's a fight there. I think that it's, it's, it's Mike Tyson punch out like or whatever when you play the first round where you, you don't even have to be any good at the video game and right. you knock them out. Like I just I firmly believe that, but I kind of welcome it like um, let's free market competition. So like let's let's play yeah. by the rules that sometimes we don't agree with. Right. I, I, I love I think that video game reference may have also been dating. Us. Oh, I dated ourselves. Babe. That's like know what you're talking eight. about. <laughs> um, yeah. And and. You know, this this is so, so interesting and, and relative to competitive advantage and market share, um, it, it astonishes me to observe companies basically saying we only want to deal with a portion of the existing possible market share out there. And it reminds me of a story my dad used to tell me um, from whom I inherited the what I, I think might be a genetic disease called entrepreneurialism or whatever. Um, and, and he was telling me a story. He was involved in Habitat for Humanity uh, for a number of years and sharing a story that with the leadership of, of Jimmy Carter and some of the others, um, someone you know raised a question at one of their conferences. Hey, if we accept a donation from so-and-so who, who maybe didn't agree with um, the, the same cultural values or what have you, does it end up tainting our our mission for Habitat for Humanity? And it was, I don't know if if I'm getting all the facts right in the story. This is how I remember it. I don't know if it was Jimmy Carter or somebody else who said, basically, 
the only money that's tainted is the money that taint ours. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing to consider for those of us participating in a competitive capitalist system. And I love, you know, let the games begin, bring it on. I love that, that, that sportsman like attitude. Let's go. Yeah. I mean, I just, I just kind of look forward to settling the debate of, you know, was Milton Friedman right? Am I right? When I rant about Milton Friedman, like, you know, I'd love to find out. I mean, and I just, I, that was kind of the point of my, um, my Ted talk was just kind of that though. Like, this is just capitalism. Like, you know, I mean, even some of the stuff that's happening right now, like this isn't, this isn't, you know, ESG, whatever you, all these trigger words now that these things that have become politicized, like it's just business. Like it's just, it's just, and honestly, right now, I think the thing that people are in denial about is this is literally just people. And it's why I will never turn down a client. Like I always ask the question, first question, intake question. Why B Corp? What is it about certification that interests you? And people say, I think we can sell more. I think it's, there's a competitive advantage in this thing. Cool. Yeah. I don't care. Yep. That's fine with me. Cause you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make a better, we're, we're going to improve the experience that your workers have. We're going to make you more attractive to employees. We're going to scale your impact that you're making in your community. We're going to decrease your environmental impact. Oh yeah. You can sell some more. But shareholder yep. value. We can drive shareholder value, but your stakeholders are going to benefit as well. So like you get into this debate of like, where do you get into the like, uh, do I like, I want you to be in it for the purest of reasons. And like, I would love you to be, but you've just proven that, that we're right. Like the demand curve shifted. That's why you want to do it. You do it. Cause you realize it's a business advantage. Cool. Well, let's go make your business better. So I think sometimes we take a, a purest approach in the yeah. B Corp community. It's kind of why I always talk about capitalism too. I'm like the majority of people that do this, like we're still capitalists, like, but that word also has been, I think, probably not politicized, but like, con- like contorted or whatever the word I'm looking for, like manipulated a little yeah. bit on one side where it's become this like horrible evil that is all things, you know, income in- inequality yeah. and all the and all the things that's grown to represent that it really is just what we've let it grow to represent, not really what it is. You know, and, and you raise this in your book, Happy Monday designing your dream career and i'm going to show this again look at that, to, uh, look at that design we had so many cool designs that end up being a post-it with a smiley face i love it i absolutely love it you know and in here you speak about conscious capitalism and i think in many respects capitalism is the canvas right so to speak and what we choose to paint on the canvas as a culture as a society um is is really uh, you know to to reference a recent podcast episode with tom chi who's managing a $450 portfolio with his company at one venture, $450 million portfolio. Um, you know, uh, economics is not a science. It's a design discipline like architecture. And we get to design it. We are designing it. It's design evolves through time. And so to your point, uh, you know, what we're doing with capitalism is is a matter of what we want to be doing with capitalism. And, and, and it's a not only a, a, a free market competition of goods and services, but also of ideas. Right. And we're, we're in this really exciting, frothy time when some ideas are winning out over others. And, and we're seeing some of the strange reactions out there as a result of certain segments realizing they're losing massive market share presently or about to. And uh, and, and so we're seeing some of those convulsions some would say death throes coming from certain sectors which is interesting and i you know i i want to in the book you you mentioned conscious capitalism i'm hoping you can unpack that a little bit for us further and then i want to ask you a question about what you know sets profitable purpose consulting apart in terms of competitive advantage but we'll, we'll get to that second yeah and i think that you know with conscious capitalism i mean speaking of it's like uh it's an art yeah, it, it, you know, like you think, I mean, there's conscious capitalism in the organizations, John Mackey, Whole Foods kind of started that whole movement. And you know, I do a lot with conscious capitalism in Atlanta. I mean, there, it's just a really, again, there's no vetting process, but I've, I've yet to meet a, a bad person at a conscious capitalism event. Like there's just a great organization, but like, I, you know, just the concept of conscious capitalism is, is exactly what you said of like, we consciously get to decide what what this looks like. And again, like you said, there's a, there's a, there's a demand curve. 
who drives the demand curve. Like at the end of the day, we, the people have all the power, like to, to do whatever we want with capitalism. We have purchasing power. We spend our money. We vote with where we want to work with how long we work there. Um, you kind of saw it with the great resignation a little bit. And like, and, and so we have these opportunities to consciously decide what version of capitalism we want to live in. Um, and I think that's where, and, and, you know, and I think we've done a disservice sometimes with the way we talk about income inequality and the way we, especially with the way we talk about climate change, we scare people so much and we don't make them feel like their actions will matter. And I think that's where we, we're getting, and you're starting to see more climate activists. I know kind of take this approach of like trying to be more optimistic, even though it's slow, like, Oh, for another time reference, when we recorded this, the seven hottest days in the history of earth were in the last week. Um, so there's a dire need, but you know, getting people to know that like, Hey, you know, just you stopping, you know, bringing reusable totes to the, to the grocery store and change it. Daggum thing. I'm in the South. Daggum. Uh, doesn't change the daggum thing, but if I start doing it and you start doing it and 100,000 people start doing it and now a million people start doing it, like thinking a little more intentionally around those lines, like so same thing with like, well, what difference does it make if I stop? I should stop bashing Shein. Let me pick another brand. I don't know. I haven't even heard of that. That'll oh, you know, it's fast fashion at its worst. Yeah, anyway, I, I guess I'm, I've got blinders on to fast. They also fashion. got like some Rico <laughs> charge or Rico lawsuit today. Um, but like whatever. If I if if I stop shopping from X Y Z company, what difference is it going to make? Well, if I stop shopping there and you stop shopping there, now they got a problem. I mean, you saw it kind of with what happened to Bud Light. Like a bunch of people yeah. collectively stopped buying it. And their sales tanked. And now if we can do that for good, instead of punishing people for supporting LGBTQ, I, that one is, I'm not touching that one on this on this episode. Give me some yep. time to digest it. But like, if we can do that same collective activism for good and all decide that we're going to start buying all birds, moonshot shoes that are like, no, literally like carbon, not carbon neutral. They're like, like zero emission. <laughs> I don't know how you made a shoe like that, but it's cool. And then they shared their playbook with everybody, but let's reward them for that. Let's drive those companies. Like let's make that business case by, by shopping with our values, by acting with our values, by taking the small little things that we need to do to, to reverse climate change. Like let's start all collectively doing these things and let's start all collectively supporting the other people doing these things. And I think then you're, you're driving the demand curve. And the direction where, sorry, capitalism is going to follow the demand curve. It's always going to follow the demand curve. That's that's it. So consciously making those decisions and consciously, you know, pushing the world in a direction, even if it's just you right now, but then you and you tell a friend and like just those ripples, like you have to believe in ripples. And I always tell people, you know, like my favorite adaptation, adapted, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh adaptation of the quote is be the change you want to see in the world, even if you're not alive to see it. Like, I think sometimes we don't, we yeah. think it has to be done like tomorrow. And if it doesn't, then it's not pure enough and we cancel everything. And like, I think we have to take more stances on like, what does this look like in 10 years to solve? I'm not saying that that's really applies to climate change because that's a now, but I think yeah. that some of our problems, we haven't solved them because we've wanted to like the miracle, like the guy in the boat where he puts the screen door on the boat and they spray it with the thing. And he's like, Hey, look, the flex seal or whatever, you know, like, well, we need to think about maybe taking that apart and building a new boat. And it's just going to be longer until we can get back out on the water. And yes, I just made a flex seal analogy from a as seen on TV product. There you go, folks. <laughs> love it. Yeah. love it, Nathan. That's it's absolutely wonderful. And let me, let me get to that, to that second question. So, you know, recognizing that there are more, and more consultants out there who are pivoting into this space, which we sort of broadly uh, call the regeneration renaissance as it applies to culture, ecology, and economy, uh, which is really exciting to see. What you know sets you apart? What sets apart your profitable purpose consulting business from others that are out there and, and maybe a little newer to the game? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I mean, well, number one, obviously, you get stories about Flex Seal. Um, <laughs> right. no. and, and, and uh, here and there. Yeah, <laughs> throwing some Southern charm. 
Um, <laughs> even though I was born in Michigan and grew up in Miami, but I've been here now longer than I've been anywhere. And you get me around Southern people and it really comes out. Um, <laughs> so what y'all get when you partner with PPC, um, honestly, I think a lot of it is the experience, you know, it's, it's the, and there's people ahead of me that have been doing this longer and that, you know, and honestly, the, it's a really cool thing about this, this ecosystem is that abundance mindset where like I have friends um, that have helped me that are in the same space as me. Um, you know, and some of them have like employees in my backyard, or like they've always been like abundance mindset with that thought of like, Hey, we can grow the pie together. And then we get bigger pieces of pie instead of trying to protect our little tiny sliver of pie right now. Uh, there's yeah. only 7,000 B Corps in the world. There's a lot more companies than 7,000. There's a yeah. lot, a lot of food on the table, but I think what one of, separates me is, I mean, in the Southeast, I'm the guy that's just been doing it. And, and, and we talk about, like, I had a client tell me this the other day, and uh, he said, you know, the coolest thing, and this is just our first meeting, is that, like, holy, like, you've, not only are you, like, connected to, like, you know, his people and culture officer, I was like, oh, you should come to the Culture and Talent Collective call. I started it back in 2018, because there was just, like, a void, so I just, like, started this call. I still run it. And he was like, I'm sorry, you do what? He's like, you've been running a call for five years. I was like, yeah, no, I was just kind of like the culture person's not HR, but you have HR. So we created a call. And then, and then um, he's like, yeah, our CEOs in the outer banks of uh, North Carolina. I was like, oh, you should come to Raleigh. Like we're doing this B Corp conference. I'm the executive director of planning this whole regional Southeastern B Corp conference. And the guy was like, dude, you literally though are like an ecosystem builder. Like, you just see it and build it. So not only are you like connected to it and know who to introduce, like you are the guy that should be, <laughs> we need to be introduced to. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing is like, and I didn't do any of that. Like I never thought I was going to be an entrepreneur. Like, I don't know. I mean, I guess I didn't think I wouldn't be. I just kind of, I'm and I'm not like Yvonne Chouinard, like accidental entrepreneur. Like I'm not Patagonia. Hopefully maybe one day. I don't know. But <laughs> all these things I was doing were just like me kind of going like, ah, oh, we could use like be local Georgia. Like, why don't we have a be local in Georgia? Like I us start to be local Georgia, you know, like build Southeast. Like I've been, I went to build mountain West in Denver in 2019 may or may not have had to do with the head and the heart playing on a Wednesday night and a conference on a Thursday, but whatever. Sometimes you need to go to red rocks, but I went to, I went to build mountain West and I was like, this is so cool. And then of course, you know, I'm like, maybe we should do a build in like Georgia. I'm like, we don't have enough B Corps, you know, there are B Corps from New Mexico and Idaho and Utah. And I was like, what do we do? Like build Southeast, but like then COVID hits and you're like, what do we just like, that would be perfect trial. Let's just do a virtual one. And so like, now nah, we're in year three, like this will be our third build Southeast and our first one in person. Um, and again, 2020, I was happily employed. Wasn't thinking about a consulting career. Wasn't, like, I mean, I was still happily employed when I left, <laughs> but I was like growing this business. So I think that's the coolest. That's the differentiating factors. Like through that work, I just know everybody. So like, what's the value at? Ask yourself that. And I'm not saying I'm the greatest consultant. I'm not saying that anybody else is like terrible at it. I mean, there's plenty of people who are super well connected, but like, I mean, I have a new client we haven't kicked off yet. And I immediately put like a bunch of their thank you, their, their, their product i put them in our our speaker thank you bags for the conference in september because i'm like well if only you knew somebody who needed to buy 40 of those right now oh i do um for our conference so i think that's the big piece of like just ask yourself like can they because that's the roi too is in the community like yeah it's like your customers are going to be aware of it but like i'm trying to build this whole thing where we're all like doing business with each other like this circular b economy so like can they introduce you to anybody? Can they open the doors? Do people like them? Um, like, and there's some other consultants that I, I can like Carolina Miranda is one of those that like anybody will make time for Carolina Miranda. She is a great choice as a consultant like me. Any like people will make like it, find those people too that can really get you into the community and get you introduced cool. um, and open some doors for you and kind of take away the newness or the whole, like the, the, the struggle of kind of like save you years off of all the networking that people like Carolyn and I had to do um, to get that reputation as, as a community builder. So anyway, that kind of it. Love it. Excellent. And, yeah, it's cool. and this cool logo. Super cool. That's, logo. That's gotta... it is, how much people pay for logos. I paid a yeah. college student $250. That's dope and tight. You wanted to get graphic to design experience. So I was like, can you build a logo for me? And I'm like, and it was so basic. I was like, it's perfect. I really like it. Yeah, it's perfect. I mean, I'm, I'm going to have to get, get one of those hats. 
The best part is my bookkeeper was like, said this was, she originally saw the, cause what did I buy this from new year or whatever? And uh, she was like, it's the only non B Corp thing I'm wearing. I'm sorry. Um, but no, she saw it and she put a like owner, owner disbursement or whatever um, <laughs> to, to file the charge away. And I was like, that's, a, and then I was wearing the hat one day. She's like, I like your hat. I was like, yeah. I was like, I bought it for the, you know, this is my logo. And she was like, oh, I need to recategorize that to marketing expense. Yeah. For so, sure. but I was actually going to a conference in New Orleans and my friend down there was like, don't bring any of that Atlanta stuff down to New Orleans. And I was like, I guys, so I ordered the hat instead. I was like, let me just come down. So now it's kind of become the, this and the red sport coat that it's kind of become the thing. Dig it. Nice. I want to, I want to make sure to ask. So you mentioned you're hosting this, this meetup, this call regarding culture and so on. How often does that occur and and how can people connect in with that if they want to? Um, So we've been doing it. I had one an hour ago. Um, We do it on the the second Friday of every month. Second. It's kind of like closed B Corp community, but like if you're working on B Corp or like in the queue or going through the assessment, we usually like, we don't, we're not like super stringent on, um, you must be this, B Corp to ride the ride. Um, and then I, I forget, like we can put it in the show notes. Like we have an event right now that we use, like we don't have a website or anything. Um, we never record the call cause it's supposed to be a safe space. Um, Cause you know, you're sharing HR stories, culture stories, employee stories. Um, we just don't, I, we, we just never have never recorded it. People always say, Oh, did you record? I'm sure there's a lot of good takeaways. I'm like, yep. Should have been there. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So like yeah, it's been, it's been fun. It's a safe space for people to learn, especially like when the B Corp, we call them beekeepers. Um, mm-hmm. It's like the person that you assign to the role of like, I don't know, your certification and then kind of like maintaining because every three years you have to recertify. So those beekeepers end up having a lot of like HRE metrics and then they have no SHRM background or anything like that. So they're kind of like, all of a sudden you're in charge of like, employee engagement and you're like what in the hell is employee engagement so like you're scrambling like so that's kind of where we were like you know maybe it would be nice if we all got together and honestly some of the people on the call are traditional hr some of them are recruiters and then a lot of them are beekeepers or the person in charge of the culture and so like we all get to learn from each other and you know traditional hr sometimes isn't as in tune with like the culture and the Versus somebody who's doing culture who might not be like, oh, we have to check all these 38 boxes to get our, you know, this, yeah. this candidate onboarded. Like there's there's different personalities in that, cool. in those roles. So it's a yeah, good Yeah, sounds great. Yeah, it reminds me a little of our monthly uh, ambassador uh, online regeneration renaissance roundtable meetup. We do the first Sunday of each month at 11.33 a.m. Mountain Time. And most of who joins for that call is uh, our ambassadors, fully activated ambassadors, but several are in the process of getting activated or a little newer to the community and the network. So yeah, it's, it's not like we exclude people, um, you know, based on checking certain boxes, it's all about collaboration and, um, uh, community and connection. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm psyched. We'll, we, we can share if you want us to the, whatever, you know, whatever the right way for people to connect with you about potentially joining your yeah. monthly call uh, would be great. And we've got a number of other links, your website um, yeah. that we'll include in the show notes as well. And let me just uh, remind folks, this is the Why on Earth Community Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron William Perry. Today, we're visiting with the founder of Profitable Purpose Consulting, Nathan Stuck in Georgia, and uh, want to be sure to mention that you can connect with uh, Nathan through his ProfitablePurposeConsulting.com website. Um, also, there's BeLocalGeorgia.com. Um, we've got a handful of uh, handles in social media, LinkedIn, um, and uh, also uh, BeImpactAssessment.net. Uh, Nathan had shared with me before we started recording for anybody who'd like to get uh, engaged with the process of of the B certification framework and want to give a shout out to our sponsors who make our podcast series possible, as well as the rest of our regeneration renaissance work that we're doing nationwide and internationally with our network of ambassadors and collaborators and our sponsors include Chelsea Green Publishing. 
We've got a 35% discount on all of their books, printed audiobooks, etc., available through our website, wineearth.org. Just go to the partners and supporters page. You'll find Chelsea Green. Also, Purium Organic Superfoods. I love them. I'm enjoying them every day now for a year. Solid Nutritious, product. delicious, amazing. Solid product placement. I like it. Yeah. Um, Purium's great. We've, we've had an episode with founder um, David Sandoval. Earth Hero, uh, sustainability products, pretty sure they're B certified. Earth Coast Productions, Waylay Waters, our biodynamically grown hemp infused aromatherapy soaking salts. Uh, Soil Works, our biodynamic uh, soil amendment. And uh, of course, a special shout out to all of our ambassadors who have joined our monthly giving program. And uh, if you haven't yet joined and you'd like to, you can join at any level that works well for you. Just go to the uh, support or donate button on the website. And if you contribute at $33 or greater uh, per month, we're happy to send you a jar um, uh, of the Waylay Waters uh, soaking salts that we make in partnership with some of the regenerative and biodynamic farms we're connected to here in Colorado. And of course, a very special shout out to our friends at 1% for the planet as well. And uh, Nathan, I'm, I'm just filling up my paper here with notes to write the summary when we publish. And I'm, I'm really, I'm so excited. It, it gives me a particular f type of joy when we're uh, so succinctly and in such a focused manner, joining the, the cultural and the, I would call even aesthetic aspects of sustainability, stewardship, regeneration, well-being, et cetera, with the economic. And um, there's so much power and magic here that we get to leverage as, as human beings and, and mobilize. Uh, and, and we're seeing so much good change occurring underway in the world and so much more that we can all help facilitate, amplify, activate. And I, uh, I'm just, I'm thrilled by all your resources. I wanted to also ask if folks want to see your TED talk, what's the best way for them to track that down? I'm pretty sure you can just Google TEDx Nathan Stuck. I'm pretty sure yeah. I was, it was at TEDx Folsom. So um, I'm pretty, yeah, I'm 99% sure that should get you there. Okay. That's great. And, and by the way, uh, I mean, I can get, I'll, I can shoot you the link too, if you want to put them in the show notes. Yeah, let's do that. That'd actually be even better. Yeah. And, and Nathan, you, you and I have had a number of conversations over the last year and we've even dropped a few uh, German words with each other. And you come from a, a German heritage and background and spend quite a bit of time in Europe. And I, I was so happy just out of curiosity, because I didn't know this off of the top of my head. I was like, I wonder what stuck means and looked it up and, and it's stucco. It's like a natural building material and or a, a piece of something, right? Like a piece of fabric or a, whatever it might be. Or, and and uh, Or something I was called as a hockey referee for years. A piece. Uh, of OK, OK, OK. <laughs> <laughs> it made, it's, a, it's a very uh, versatile term, I, I guess. Um, but I just, I also, lo I love one of the ways that you seem to bring this, a genius to this focal point, this nexus is your ability to interface with so many different cultures, subcultures, right? Whether we're talking about the South, the Southeast and here in the United States, we're talking about the various cultures in Europe and, and elsewhere. And I, I wanted to just kind of ask you, like, what is it about you and maybe we'll dive a little deeper into this during our behind the scenes segment that we share with our ambassadors. You know, what is it about you and your background and your maybe it's something special in your childhood that has given you this this gift of being able to relate to and interact with so many different diverse groups of people? Um, you know, I, I, a couple of years ago, I probably said I have no idea. Um, and then I had a friend. <laughs> In Atlanta. Oh, um, my friend Lavanya asked me, she's like, Nathan, where are you from? And I was like, Miami. She went, that makes so much sense. Um, and I was like, well, sir, what? She's like, you just fit in. Like, wherever you go, like, you walk in a room and you just blend right in. And no, you're not, it's not awkward. Like, and especially sometimes in Atlanta, some events I go to, I'm like, I might be one of like three or four white people in the room. That's normal, except in Miami, it was, they were like, South American, Cuban, Dominican, like I play baseball. So like practice was in Spanish. 
So there's nothing weird about that to me um, to walk into that room and just go like, oh, cool. Hi, I'm Nathan. Nice to meet you. (laughs) Like, so I think that's part of it. And then, you know, and then like mom, I mean, mom wasn't, she came over when she was five. So I can't say mom was, I mean, she technically was off the boat, um, like literally, because it was in the 50s. So she, they took a boat. Um, but like Oma and Opa, like German side, like towards the end, too. Like, I mean, I learned German to be able to understand their fights. And so like learning German, then I was like, oh, I'm going to go over to Europe. And like, so I discovered this whole like German heritage and like and understanding the culture and like Oma and Opa, like take your shoes off when you walk in the house, put on your house shoes, like all those little things that it like. I don't know. And like that got me into soccer. So that gets and That's a whole other cultural bonding experience when you're sitting at a table, at like a world cup, just like watching games at a bar. But like these people are Chinese and these people are South African and these people are from Denmark. And like, so I don't know. I, I, I guess that's kind of my answer is, is maybe the fact that like, yeah, I, I the Germanness plus Miami is just kind of like, and then probably 20 years in the South. And then even like the Midwestern though, like, you know, that's where both my parents grew up. So like you can drop me off in like Bay city, Michigan, where my dad's from and I can, you know, saddle up to the bar and make friends there. So like, I don't know, maybe I'm just like Norm from cheers. Love it. Was it Will Rogers? Never met a stranger. You know, like, obviously just, a, a little sense of humor goes a long way in this sort of thing, but you, you really, you really have a gift, man. And I, I admire it. And, you know, another thing I really admire about you in the handful of calls we've had catching you walking to yet another volunteer meeting, you're, you're so involved in the community and you're a busy entrepreneur, obviously very focused on the work you're doing, what you're doing for your clients, your bottom line, growing your business. And you're making a lot of time for, volunteering in various organizations in your community. And, and I think that, uh, you know, this is, this is part of the magic that probably more and more of us can experience and enjoy in terms of our quality of life and connections and relationships. But the way you, you manage all of that is, is really admirable. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'm on pace. <laughs> I keep a spreadsheet. Well, I'm also a B Corp. I, I track my <laughs> metrics. Um, <laughs> I'm on pace for 540 volunteer hours this year, which Hopefully we'll taper down after September when the conference hits. Um, or I guess, well, when you're listening to this, that hopefully it has tapered down already. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just one of those two where it's just like, I almost like the older you get, the more you realize that like, you know, you're younger in your career and you'd be like, I don't know why they just don't do this. I don't know why they just don't do that. They should change this policy. And you're like, change it, go do it. Like, you know, like, and you're like, Nathan just complains a lot. You're like, everybody just thinks I'm a complainer. I'm just pointing out what's wrong and not stepping up to actually do any of the work. That's why you're labeled as a complainer. So I think like you get to this, like you get older and like, luckily the sun's kind of gone down. So my beard looks less gray now, but you get older, you get this perspective of like, if you're going to say something or complain about something, you better be willing to do it. And you better be willing to, to do the work needed. Like I had lunch with some people yesterday. And I was like, look, I don't need another initiative. I just want to know how can I plug in to help with whatever wheel you're building? Cause I don't need We don't need another organization. I don't need to, but you know, you start to look at like, if I'm going to sit here and say like, Oh, Athens lacks this like entrepreneurial, like organizing entity. Hi, economic development folks. Hi, chamber of commerce folks. What's missing. How can I help? Yeah. Yep. I'm not just sitting here just like complaining like Athens. Well, Athens will just never get better because we don't have this. It's like, oh, Athens needs this. And I don't know. I roll off a nonprofit board next year. Maybe I have the bandwidth. So mm-hmm. I just kind of maybe that, I mean, of all the calls to action, that might be my favorite one of like, mm-hmm. like if you see it, to do it. If it needs fixing, don't walk by it. You know, if there's a piece of trash on the road, bend over and pick it up. Like, you know, just to kind of stop with, I mean, that's kind of what, how we got ourselves into this mess is we just assume somebody's going to clean up after whatever it is. Somebody's got, somebody else will fix it. Somebody else will clean up. Somebody else will take the initiative. And it's like, just do it. And people respect it. Like, I mean, and you think about it too, like even volunteering, like how many, I mean, I have a, I have a, a client that I met volunteering at a community farm that happened to yeah. be an entrepreneur. And also they're like, Oh, it's actually some pretty good networking too. Is that here? cutting down English Ivy or no, it was kudzu. We were cutting down. And then it was like, Oh, kept talking for another two hours. Yeah. Three years later, she calls me up and says, Hey, I think we're ready to certify as a B Corp. I'm like, Oh yeah. 
I love I'm it. As, help you. As, as we say in, in the permaculture world, stacked functions, right? Whenever we're doing anything that seems social, it's also connected to our work, our purpose, our mission, our, all, all these different things are interconnected. Yeah. I mean, and that's, so you put good out in the world. I mean, all I'm going to say is in the last seven years since I got my MBA, I've, I've been focused on putting good in the world and connecting people, you know, never looking for anything in return. You just do good, connect yeah. this person to that person, do this and that. And man, the, the, the reciprocity that has hit me of, of just good finding me. Mm -hmm. Um, but you're kind of putting yourselves in that, you, you know, like you create your own luck. So, I mean, I think there's, there's a karmic justice to yeah. good return to you, but I think there's also like, you're putting yourself, you put yourself in that situation to meet a client because you went and volunteered for no reason other than you wanted to. I didn't go looking, expecting like, well, I hope I brought business cards today. <laughs> like, no, I'm wearing my worst clothes and nothing logo, no nothing. I'm ready. To, like, what's my task today? Am I small? No. Oh God. Kudzu. <laughs> so like, I think that's yeah. just, I think people just, just put good out in the world and see what happens. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. It's one of the subtler aspects of the, maybe the law of attraction that, you know, some of us are consciously cultivating and it, it what you're describing and what you're embodying uh, reminds me of, of one of my favorite points you make in your book. Um, in addition to speaking about humility and, and here's the book once more, happy Monday, designing your dream career. In, in addition to speaking about humility, you say that it's about working harder on ourselves than on our jobs, right? And man, that I think is the, for, for leadership, for efficacy professionally, I think this is the, the secret sauce. Yeah, well, and it's a Jim Rohn quote, learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. If you work hard on your job, you'll make a living. If you work hard on yourself, you'll make a fortune. And, you know, and honestly, too, it's funny because our culture and talent collective call today, we talked about like, how do we, how do we manage the pendulum swing back from employer employee market to employer market? And what, you know, how do we kind of like land it in the sweet spot? And, you know, and then we kind of got into talking about like, you know, some of the coddling and some of the, like you, you have this, you know, when you're younger and, and you have this desire to like want the C-suite, you know, and everybody thinks it's like, Oh, this next generation. No, we were the same way. We were dumb. We didn't know what we were talking about. Like, sure. I should run an enterprise rent a car with three years of professional experience. Surely I'll make some great decisions. Like I was the same way at 25, but like, I think right now where I've seen some of the, and I mean, I literally said this week had an article published on medium about social impact burnout. And, and what I want to make sure that we talk about is like, Social impact, like all of this stuff, like it's it's a and it's an awareness of the mental health issue. It's awareness of burnout. It's yeah. an awareness that to eliminate this, it, I, I'm in no way advocating for people to just like, oh, we should all just like, you know, if you like get like, I don't know, put in like 30 hours a week, like you, you're you get there. Like anybody who's built a business, like it is hard. I didn't have these grades before I started this business. It's hard work. I got bags under my eyes. I was Friday night that we're recording this. I will be working tonight because I didn't yeah. get to all of my client stuff today. Like it requires hard work and it requires any CEO, any like, it's not about the work. It's about what are you getting out of the work? Mm -hmm. And like, how are you setting yourself up for future success? So like that quote to me now hits home where I'm like, as I wrote the book, I started thinking about like, huh? Yeah. I invested a lot in myself in my twenties. I was also working really hard, like even enterprise 50, 60 hours, but I got really good at managing numbers. Like all those things where at the time you're like, Oh, I'm just working hard for somebody else at enterprise. I was taking away a lot. And when I was doing sales, I was working really hard for enterprise. I went in outside sales. I developed sales skills. I got really good at pitches and phone calls and how to talk to people and read personality types and adjust and mirror and all these things where you're like, and then, you know, all of a sudden you're an entrepreneur later in life. And you're like, huh, I have to manage all these numbers. Huh. I have to sell. I am the sales team now. Yeah. So like, yeah. like put the hours in. And when you're young, like, even if it's not what you want to do forever, like put those hours in and learn and become the best, try to be the best you can be at whatever you're doing. And you won't know why yet. Mm -hmm. um, but investing in like the skill building, stop looking at it as like, oh man, like, 
you know, don't sign up to just wash cars in the back. If you work at enterprise, sign up to like run the daily report and look through the numbers and make sure all this stuff, you know, like yeah. sign up for the thing that's going to teach you more. That's going to set you up for future success. Um, read the books, go to the seminars, go to the conferences, take your, you know, invite your boss out for coffee to pick their brain. Like those types of things, like make yourself better all the time and invest in yourself because it will pay off. But I think we're in a weird way with all the stuff we're doing with mental health and, you know, even social impact burnout, we're like telling people like, Hey, it's okay. Just like, like four day work week, like seven hour days, just like 28 hours. Like you'll totally. And like, I don't know if we're doing a service or a disservice to people when it's like, mm. you know, I think we need to be talking more about like, Hey, when you're at where I am tomorrow is a computer free day for me. We're going to Atlanta. We're going to hang out with some friends. Like know when you're burning out and how to step back versus just like, Hey, no, like you're going to make it in life. If you don't really, you don't really have to do a whole lot. Like I just kind of, you know, without it sounding like this horrible, like thing where like you must work until your knuckles bleed. Right. I think we have to figure out how we walk that line. But I think that it's important that, that our young listeners and I'm only 40, so I'm still learning, but know that, like make those investments in yourself, like yeah. outwork the competition. Like that's still a thing. Like outwork the, you don't have to be working all the time, but outwork the competition and know when it's time to take a break. That makes sense. Love it. Yeah. Sage <laughs> advice, sage advice, Nathan. And I, yeah, I so appreciate it. And, um, you know, before we wrap up the podcast interview, I have one more question I want to ask about your website and, we're also going to do a little behind the scenes segment for our ambassador network. And if you're interested, uh, audience in uh, becoming an ambassador and connecting in and getting access to our behind the scene discussions with many of our podcast guests and exclusive uh, videos, recordings, and we actually do record our monthly meetups, but those recordings are available only to our activated ambassadors and they really are a treasure trove. Um, you can you can connect with the Why on Earth community uh, at whyonearth.org to uh, engage with us in that manner. And I'm looking forward, Nathan, to picking up a couple of these threads in our behind the scenes piece here in just a few minutes. But before we wrap up, I do want to ask one uh, final question about your website. It really struck me. I'd love to hear more and, and make sure I understand um, two of the offerings you have there, accelerator cohort certifications and fractional leadership. Can you just briefly walk us through what those uh, two things are? If you are a foundation that would like to pay for a cohort of companies to go through, we would love to talk to you. So we've done a couple funded, like, I mean, accelerator is probably a loose term because it's not a traditional like startup accelerator. Mm -hmm. It's more of a, we did one in Birmingham with a foundation there where we got five companies through. And we worked with them. We call it certifying and storytelling. Mm. Uh, it's got to have a little Southern twist. Um, but my business partner, Twana and I, who we, we're not, we we're not, we have our own separate businesses and we collaborate all the time. So I don't know if that's a business partner or a collaborator, collaborative partner. Um, but Twana and I, and she's a storyteller by nature and I'm a B Corper by nature. So I worked with them on the certification and she worked with them on the kind of the storytelling and what's the brand and how is this going to how are we going to work B Corp into our existing brand and just beyond that? So we've got, I think we ended up submitting four of the five um, companies that went through it. And one of them is one of them. I think we have a verification call coming up. So hopefully by the time this is out, four of them are certified. And then we, in Atlanta, we did another one similar with three companies. Um, excuse me. And uh, we had actually, it was a small business an SBA uh, grant to an organization. And then I got chosen to come in and um, do the work. So we helped them do it. So we've been trying to push more and more of those and trying to identify foundations and things where it's like, especially in the South where, you know, we were able of those eight companies that we worked with. Seven were all eight were female and seven were BIPOC owned. So like talk about like bringing diversity into this community and, and making it, you know, some of the accessibility and inclusivity, you know, oh. where it's like, you know, especially when you're talking like, you know, a, a, a you know, a one, two year old company is 50,000 in revenue. I asked him to spend yeah. 10, 15,000 dollars on a B Corp consultant. That's kind of a tall task, but somebody else can write that check for them. 
yeah. um, and nice. make their business better along the way. Like, okay, let's do that all day, every day. So that's, that's the, um, the accelerator cohorts. And then fractional leadership, honestly, I've had a couple of clients take me up on this, even my whole job actually, uh, where once we finish the B Corp thing, it's like, okay, what do we do next? Cool. And so they end up kind of keeping us on to do some of that work as, as they kind of figure out like, what is next? Well, here's our, you know, we're going to put together our culture calendar for the year and we're going to do all the stuff I used to do in my old job where I'm like, well, we could continue, like we could be your beekeeper internally Mm -hmm. or at least direct the beekeeper. And some people will keep me on for like three months to just kind of like, okay, so we've identified person X is going to be the beekeeper. Well, for the first three months, let me work with them um, and, and be, and make them available, you know, or make me available to them. So when they have questions and they don't know what to do or they don't know where to go or they need an introduction, then I'm still there and I'm not, you know, doing everything, which I will do the majority of those introductions. But it's kind of a nice gesture when I can bill you for a bunch of time that at some point, oh, I need three introductions. Well, that's probably 30 minutes of my time at 730 Mm -hmm. that night. So Mm -hmm. be nice to bill you. So that's kind of the fractional stuff. And then obviously it goes beyond that, too. Some people want me to actually want us to come in and really build out like the culture roadmap and yeah. really be like full-time fractional culture officer. Um, yeah. So yeah, it runs the gamut. Cool. Super valuable services you're offering there. And I imagine most of our audience knows uh, the term BIPOC um, black indigenous people of color, just in case anybody was not clear on what that is. Um, Nathan, it's so, so great visiting with you, man. And uh so great what you're doing, excited about um, our connection and, and growing collaboration and uh, excited to share this discussion with the world. Before we sign off, I just I want to give you the, the floor if there's anything else uh, that you'd like to say. Ooh, I suppose to think it's something noble. Uh, if you're looking at the wall behind me, I don't know, go dogs. Um, <laughs> no, I think my I will just say. Um, you know, as you go out there, like business owners, people, like we have a more power than we think to shape the world in the way we want it to be. Um, but it starts with each one of us making those right decisions and not waiting on others to do that for us. So be a leader, not a follower, lead others into those decisions and lead by example by making them and and don't always look for the reward and don't always put the spotlight on yourself. Um, good things will come out of that. Aho, amen. So mode it be right on. Yeah, brother. It's one of those where you're like blue Yeti drop. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Mine's black. <laughs> <laughs> or, or is blue the brand? <laughs> Blue's the brand. Yeah. Blue Yeti. I don't know. Somebody told me this is like the premier podcasting microphone. Yeah. Yeah. I have the very same thing over here. Um, this is so great, Nathan. Yeah. And we'll, uh, we'll conclude the episode there. Here's, here's this one. Um, we'll con- conclude the episode here and then, uh, do our, our little behind the scenes segment. So, uh, thanks to everybody for tuning in and thanks Nathan for taking the time to visit with us today. See you, man. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. The why on earth community stewardship and sustainability podcast series is hosted by Aaron William Perry, author, thought leader, and executive consultant. The podcast and video recordings are made possible by the generous support of people like you. To sign up as a daily, weekly, or monthly supporter, please visit whyonearth.org backslash support. Support packages start at just $1 per month. The podcast series is also sponsored by several corporate and organization sponsors. You can get discounts on their products and services using the code Y on Earth, all one word with a Y. These sponsors are listed on the whyonearth.org backslash support page. If you found this particular podcast episode especially insightful, informative, or inspiring, please pass it on and share it with a friend whom you think will also enjoy it. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your support. And thank you for being a part of the Why on Earth community.